Okay, so this is a fourth part of the fourth and final part of the talk. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit now about um, something about angular scales and also about um, the measurements uh, of time in astronomy, which is quite a quite a big and deep uh, subject. So uh, by no means am I going to cover all of the intricacies and subtleties of, uh, of all of this, but it's mostly to give you an idea of a sort of jumping off point so you can do your own own reading about this and then understand uh, commonly used um, notations uh, that you'll encounter in your career. Um, so let's, uh, to begin with, again, just sort of backing up a little bit, let's talk about um, uh, how angles are measured uh, in astronomy. You may already be familiar with this because you've probably seen it before, especially when I was talking about right ascension and declination uh, earlier. Uh, but just to recap, um, the in general, they use the, um, the system which divides uh, one degree into 60 what are called minutes of arc and each minute of arc contains 60 seconds of arc. So there'll be 3,600 seconds of arc to a degree. So imagine there's 360 degrees in a circle. Uh, each degree has 60 minutes of arc in it. And each minute of arc has 60 seconds of arc in it. Um, so those are the kind of notations you'll see for declination, for example, uh, all of the time. Um, and again, the um, you know to add to the sort of confusion sometimes you f when you're talking about right ascension, you've got the option of specifying that in time or in angle units. It's more commonly specified in time units, but you can work it out in angular units as we saw before. Uh, so you can do either as long as you make it clear which which one you're doing. Um, so all you do is just consider the you know that the the Earth rotates 360 degrees in 24 hours, um, so that means that one hour must correspond to 15 degrees. One degree in time must therefore correspond to four, four minutes, just doing the division. One second of arc corresponds to four seconds of time. One minute of arc corresponds to a fifteenth of a second of time. So when you say minutes and seconds you need to be careful about whether you're talking about minutes and seconds in time or minutes of seconds of of arc because they have two two distinct meanings uh, a minute of time is obviously a, a 60th of an hour of time whereas a minute of a, of a degree is a 60th of a degree right so you can convert between the two two things just by by simple arithmetic so for example going just the, the thing to remember that I always remember is is one hour is is uh, corresponds to fifteen degrees. So I mean the the Earth rotates by fifteen degrees uh, in an hour. So if you keep that in your head, then you'll be able to sort of do hand calculations going from degrees to time quite quite easily. Um, just just to get a, a, an idea of of what um, you know what is a a degree anyway in the context of um you know walk, walking out and looking at the night sky um well the thing to uh remember as this diagram illustrates is that you know for most people with average sized fists and average sized arms if they hold their arm out uh and close their fist hold their arm fully out then the width of their fist is about 10 degrees right Given given the length, you know, given the average length of arms and the average length of size of fists, um, the width of your fingernail, little fingernail, is is about one degree. So if you're ever, you know, looking at things on in the night sky and you want to know roughly how how far they are away in degrees from each other, this can be quite a useful thing to do. And again, if you spread your fingers out, you get twenty five degrees or so. Um, another thing to remember. Uh, you know, just to get a scale for things is that the the size of the full moon uh, on the sky is, is half a degree. Um, 
so you know if you think about if you're looking at something and you can imagine how many lunar diameters you are away from it then again that gives you a kind of nice um intuitive way of uh of understanding the size of these things actually on the sky uh, and the sun is the same uh, so the sun is also uh, a half a degree or 30 minutes of arc um this changes a little bit because the uh the uh, the orbit is not perfectly circular it's elliptical um so yeah people with keen eyesight can uh, distinguish objects at about an arc minute in diameter so okay so as if things were not complicated enough we've talked about um the celestial coordinate system the equatorial coordinate system uh, we've talked about the horizon coordinate system we've talked about the ecliptic coordinate system i've mentioned the galactic coordinate system which is based on our own galaxy um, but the horrific thing is is that these uh, coordinate systems aren't fixed in time so if the earth just rotated on its axis and that direction of rotate, rotation didn't change and it was always pointing in the same direction in space, uh, things would be pretty simple. Uh, but that's not actually what happens. So the Earth, as it goes around the sun and as it rotates on its own axis, um, the uh, direction of the rotation axis actually uh, wobbles now when I say wobble it doesn't wobble quickly it it wobbles very slowly uh, over a period of 25,800 years uh, now the reason for this wobble uh, or precession uh, which you may remember from your undergraduate physics is because the um, the earth is spinning so it, so it's not a perfect sphere so it bulges out so it's actually very slightly bulging out at the equator, right? Uh, and because the the force of gravity is now acting slightly more on this side than on this side because of this bulge, you get a torque in the direction, a twisting force in the direction of the going into the into the plane of the of the screen there. So something that's wanting to twist the uh, the uh, the earth in that direction where those arrows are right uh, now because the earth is spinning what doesn't happen is it tries to twist it in that direction then it twists in that direction it actually wobbles around like a like a child's uh, spinning top so if you've done your um uh, first second year mechanic classical mechanics courses and you've looked at gyroscopes for example and looked at uh, rigid body dynamics you'll 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 uh, you'll remember this effect um so so what happens is is the the tidal forces of the of the sun and moon acting differently on either side of the earth cause a torque which causes a precession which causes the direction of the axis of rotation of the earth to go on a on a on a cycle uh, that lasts 25800 years right so this means what does this mean in practice then well at the moment, the um, direction of the rotation of the planet Earth uh, points very close to a star that we call Polaris, which is the pole star. Um, but if I go uh, 13,000 years from now, it's going to point at a very different uh, star in the sky. Right. So and so the so the the direction in space, if you like, of the um, of the rotation axis of the earth is constantly changing very slowly and not by much but this is you know awkward because it means that in you know because we've defined all of our right ascension and declination coordinates are based on that axis the fact that that axis is not constant in a constant direction in space is a is a problem so what can you do about it well not much but what what you have to do is um Make sure that when you are defining right ascension and declination coordinates, you're very careful to say at what date they correspond to. So like on the, the J2000 epoch, as it's called, 
means that that's what the right ascension declination coordinate system would be in the year 2000 when the axis of the Earth was pointing in in whatever direction it was pointing in. Similarly, B1950 will be uh, the same thing, but when where the axis was pointing in 1950. Um, so, so these this is just something to bear in mind so that so th these standard 2000 and 1950 dates are chosen for mo you know mostly j2000 now for most astronomical catalogs for your uh right ascension declination coordinates so that's just something that you have to an extra complication that you have to bear in mind um and you might have you can also define a, a local uh right ascension declination which is the right ascension declination of where the uh based on where the axis of the earth is pointing right now rather than in 2000 so that's, that's something else that can be can be defined um so that effect there of the sun moon tidal interaction with the with the spinning earth is called precession but it gets even worse because there are other uh, objects in the solar system uh which interact with the uh earth uh, gravitationally and have their own tidal effects on it uh, for example jupiter is is by far the largest one in our solar system and then but then all of the other planets uh, that's because it's it's uh, mo most massive and reasonably close to uh, compared to some of the others say saturn um, but you can imagine you've got all of the planets of the solar system and they're all going on the, uh, rotating on their own orbits uh, and that gravitational field is is interacting with the distorted shape of the Earth, and this produces another effect, which is quite com which is quite a complicated shape, uh, superimposed a smaller effect, but it's superimposed on on the precessional cycle, uh, and this effect is called mutation. So you hear, you know, you, you you can again, this can be is extremely well studied because we can. Uh, we know a lot about the orbits and, and masses of the of, of the planets, but again, you 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 need to do corrections for precession and mutation in, in you know to do certain um, calculations in um, spherical astronomy. So that's something else to um, to look out for. Uh, the period of fluctuation is about eighteen point six years for uh, uh, for the new, for mutation, and again, the, the precession is twenty five thousand eight hundred years. Um, third thing that is um, that adds uh, complication and hassle to the whole enterprise is the fact that the Earth is actually slowing down on its on its rotational axis. So as I as I said, the Earth is bulging out here, um, and the tidal force is acting on that bulge actually dissipate energy by flexing and and um ex, you know ex, expanding and attracting different parts of the earth's crust at different times so because it has the tidal interaction with the sun and the moon the earth loses a tiny little bit of energy every time it rotates now not much energy compared to the solar rotational energy but again the day the 24 hour day normal 24 hour day is getting slower as the, the earth is losing rotational energy and the amount that it's getting slower is tiny it's getting slower by the day gets slower by 1.4 milliseconds every 100 years but depending on the accuracy of your astronomical calculation and astronomical positioning uh, you might need to take this into account um so this is this is a, a third uh, complication to the whole problem of problems of spherical astronomy so the subject gets pretty complicated pretty quickly so uh let's talk a little bit about uh the kind of um notations that are used to describe time now and the different kinds of astronomical time um so obviously you're probably familiar that you know that there is different time zones uh, on the earth as the earth uh, rotates so so these time zones are set that um that the sun is overhead roughly at 12 noon each day um obviously you've got the complication of daylight saving times as well but you can always look that up and take that off um the 
uh, main time that's used for astronomy uh, is called universal time coordinated UTC time. So that's based on uh, the ultimately on the use of highly precise uh, atomic clocks, which are much more precise than, you know, uh, sort of setting your time relative to, uh, say, Earth rotation, as, as we discussed, which is affected by all, all sorts of um, all sorts of different factors and is slowing down continuously. Whereas an atomic clock, if you keep it under the right conditions, will be extremely accurate uh, way of, of measuring time. So everything nowadays is is um, is tied to atomic clock uh, uh, periods of time, measures of time, effectively. Um, so the UTC time is the atomic clock time that you would have if you were sat on the Greenwich uh, meridian. Uh, so obviously you have different time zones depending on on where you are. Uh, uh, on Earth, so the, the first thing you, you need to do in generally, uh, you know, when thinking about time in astronomy, is figure out where you are on Earth and then convert that to uh, universal Greenwich Mean Time, and then universal, well, roughly to Greenwich Mean Time, just by subtracting the numbers of hours off, and then to more precisely to universal UTC time. I'll just skip through this. Okay, so. Again, the the thing, you know, the fact that this um, this effective precession is happening adds complications even to uh, what the definition of a of a year is. So there are two different definitions of a year. Uh, what's called the tropical period, uh, which is the period of time it takes for the sun to go, the Earth to go around the sun and the two axes to then realign uh, in the same position. Um, and then the orbital sidereal period, sidereal means to do with the stars, um, which is um, without uh, that uh, taking the precession effect uh, into account, right? Because in one year, the wobble of the Earth's axis has, has moved a little bit. So again, you have different... Um, measures of a year which which differ not by much 20 minutes or so but again these these are the kind of complications that you run into uh, when you're trying to do your uh, calculations your, in uh, spherical astronomy okay so so a key concept in the measurement of time in astronomy is the distinction between a so solar time or a solar day and what's called sidereal time which is with respect to the stars, the, to what used to be called the fixed stars. So the difference between the two uh, things is pretty clear if you just think about the geometry of, of what's going on. So you could define the length of a day by saying it's the time period it takes until the sun is in the same position again in the sky that it was yesterday. Right, so, um, so that is twenty. That is your twenty-four hour day, right? So that's called a solar day. Now, interestingly enough, the period of time that it takes uh, for the Earth to rotate so that a star is in the same position in the sky is not the same. Uh, and hopefully, this diagram will illustrate why that is. Right. So what's happening is. The Earth's rotating on its axis here, uh, but it's also going along the Earth's, the, the roughly circular Earth's orbit. So if it rotates, uh, a star is very far away compared to the sun, so the rays can be considered parallel. So, so suppose it rotates one so that the star is in the same position, so it's pointing along these two lines, parallel lines here, so the star is directly overhead. It actually has to rotate a little bit further so that the sun would be over overhead uh, at the same time. Be and the reason for that is because it's moved along this roughly circular orbit. So it rotates, rotates once and then it has to rotate a little bit more, 0.986 degrees more, to put the sun in the same position overhead. So 
if the sun position overhead, that's a 24 hour day, that's your solar day. The sidereal day uh, is less than that, right? Because you've got to rotate an extra amount to bring the sun back overhead again. Um, so the sidereal day is um, 23 hours and 56 minutes and four seconds long, not 24 hours long. Um, so that means that, that each star um, will rise and set. Uh, if a star rose at 9 p.m. tonight, it will rise at 8.56 p.m. tomorrow, roughly four minutes um, different, a degree of rotation of a circle corresponds to four minutes in time. So, so for this reason, each star um, you know, rises and sets at a different time of the year uh, compared to our solar time, which we're, which we're counting uh, daily. Um, and this makes sense, right? Because if you, you know, if you look at the stars that are visible uh, at midnight in July, they won't be the same as the stars that are visible at midnight in February or something like this, right? Because the Earth is is continuously rotating around the sun. So the so the stars that are visible at midnight uh, change gradually through the year. So it makes sense that the stars are going to have to uh, rise and set at slightly earlier times, uh, four minutes earlier each day. Um, so this is why you might talk about having, you know, winter constellations and, and summer constellations and so on and so forth. Um, so, so again, when people talk about times and days and things like this in astronomy, are they talking about a solar day or are they talking about a sidereal day? And sidereal is just a Latin term for meaning to do with the stars. Um, so I've talked about um, UTC, which is universal time coordinated, which is the most commonly used measure of time in astronomy. Uh, but uh, this is related to um, a time scale called UT1, um, which is derived from the rotation of the Earth, essentially. So UTC uh, is essentially corrected to and pinned to um, uh, atomic clocks. Uh, and UT1 is to do with the rotation uh, of the Earth. Now, the problem, you know, here is, you know, the, the period of the Earth rotation is somewhat irregular because of all of these gravitational effects and it's slowing down and so on and so forth. So if you just did nothing and you just had an atomic clock, which is just counting in seconds, minutes and hours, and you had this UT1 based time uh, system, uh, because of all of these effects, they would gradually uh, become out of sync, right, out of synchronization. Um, so in order to keep them into synchronization, uh, what happens is uh, that occasionally leap seconds are added to the UTC uh, scale. So rather than the seconds increasing one second at a time, at a certain point they increase two, to two seconds at the time. And this keeps the, uh, the UT1 Earth rotation time scale, if you like, and the atomic clock time scale um, within, you know, within acceptable limits, so they don't drift too far apart. You know, they don't drift minutes and, uh, and hours apart. So, th so this is done um, occasionally, again, based on observation, astronomical observations. Um, these leap seconds are inserted, and the attempt is to keep that time period within point. Those two measures of time within 0.9 seconds. Of each other, and again, lots of radio astronomy, such as the Hart Ray Telescope, is involved in some, doing some of these these uh, these timing studies, um, measuring the length of the day uh, using quasars, for example. Um, skip over that. Uh, so, sidereal time um, is a useful uh, measure when it comes to uh, working out something which is called um, local apparent sidereal time or local sidereal time as it's uh, as it's often um, abbreviated to um, so what is local sidereal time so the 
the easiest way to think about this is to have a look at this diagram here, which will appear, I think, in a minute. Yeah. So suppose you're standing on the surface of the Earth and you have the zenith above you and north and south directions there. And then you have the meridian line, which I talked about earlier, going from here to here. The local sidereal time is the right ascension coordinate of that meridian line. Right, so that's 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 the thing to remember. So local sidereal time is is what is the right ascension coordinate right now on my on my local meridian? Right, so that meridian passes through the celestial pole. Um, so therefore, it's a great circle of the equatorial system. So it will have a, a specific um, right ascension. Uh, so that's a useful thing to know for all sorts of reasons. I mean, the, uh, an obvious reason is if you calculate the local sidereal time, then you know uh, what right ascension is above you in the sky. So you know, roughly speaking, what uh, astronomical objects you can observe, especially the, the ones that will be high in the sky. Um, so you can calculate it for, uh, so, so it's useful for that reason. Um, the other reason it's useful is you can use it to calculate something called the hour angle. Um, so the hour angle is the angle, here is an object in the sky, so there's my meridian there. This orange blob is, is, is some object in the sky, so you can actually imagine the object rising uh, in the east, uh, rotating around this around this disc here, over here, passing over the meridian, which is called a transit, and then and then setting in the in the west. The hour angle is the is the angle between this meridian and the great circle that's going through that uh, that object there. So it's this this angle here uh, in orange. Right? So you can visualize that. So so if you know that the hour angle is um, two hours in in time units, then you know that it's going to be either it's got either going to take two hours to go from where it is to the meridian, um, or it's just past the meridian for two hours, right? Depending on whether it's positive or negative. So, so a negative hour angle of two hours means that it will be two hours until the object crosses the zenith meridian. If you've got a positive two hour, hour angle, that will mean that it's been two hours since it has crossed the, uh, the zenith meridian. So again, you will hear this kind of um, terminology often used in thinking about preparing you know, astronomical observations in practice. You'll be like, okay, so I know that I've you know I've got some telescope time next June or whatever, and I know where the telescope is. Um, I wonder what the right ascension is at at this particular time. So in order to to work that out, I'll work out the the local sidereal time. That'll tell me what the right ascension is um, on the zenith meridian, which is a useful thing to know. And then for particular objects, you could work out what the hour angle was. So that would actually give you some sense of of whether the thing was rising or setting, whether it's positive or negative, uh, and how long it either had to take to cross the zenith meridian or how long it's been since it's crossed the zenith meridian. So these these are kind of useful um, just numbers to know and then can be, and can be worked out quite quickly and uh, you know sometimes on the on the back of an envelope. So that, there's the formula that um, uh, defines the hour angle. So it's just the local sidereal time, which is the the right ascension on the zenith meridian minus the the right ascension of the object, and that will give you how many how many hours, which is a, again using it to to measure both, if you like, time and angular distance uh, you'll have until either it crosses the meridian or since it's crossed the meridian. So again, have a have a read up on that, um, just so you know the terminology and you can. Uh, Read about all of these things. Um, so this is the final slide. So, um, so if you think about, you know, you know, this image here is is 
you know tells you a lot about everything that I've just been uh, talking about because and I'm you've probably seen images like this before and the way that image is taken is you get a camera and you point it uh, towards the if you're in the northern hemisphere towards the north northern horizon and you open rather than having the shutter time uh, just open and close very quickly you leave the shutter time open you leave the shutter open for several hours so it's gathering light for several hours um so what happens is all of the star so the earth is rotating on it on its axis so from our point of view it looks as though the stars are rotating around the axis of the earth right the the axis which defines the north celestial pole so all the stars uh follow this these circular tracks around uh, a central point which is the north celestial pole and very close to the north celestial pole i think it's probably that little blob there is the um the pole star polaris right so you can see you know from that view when we're talking about you know what is the altitude of the north celestial pole well it's 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 that distance there measured in measured in degrees and as the earth rotates it looks as though all of the stars um, move in circles around around that north celestial pole the other thing you can see that's that's interesting here is that you can see that stars that are sufficiently close in terms of angle to the north celestial pole never never set so they're always visible right so you can actually work out uh so anything that's so that the, the distance the elevation of the north celestial pole is equal to the latitude uh, so any star that's clo closer than the you know the latitude in degrees to the north celestial pole will never set at a certain location on the Earth, whereas the other ones, say the ones over here, are clearly going to rise, form a circle uh, over the period of the night, and then set again. So they'll rise in the uh, east and set in the west. Um, so those kind of images tell you a lot and help you visualize a lot of the things that we've been uh, been talking about um, today in terms of the relationship between the uh, the equatorial coordinate system and your local horizon coordinate system. And again, this is this is sort of showing the same kind of thing. The, this would be the um, you know if if you were if you were sat at the North Pole, the stars would uh, streak across the sky like this. That would be if you're in the northern hemisphere um, and so on. So and if you're at the equator, close to the equator, the stars would, would follow that kind of that kind of path where that's the uh, that's the northerly direction there. OK, so I think uh, that's it for today. So this is the end of the, um, the last um, talk. So thank you very much for listening uh, and you'll have um, your exercises uh, to do shortly and they'll be based on those. Um, two things that we've already discussed about that table of um, uh, apparent uh, altitudes of the North Celestial Pole and so on. So filling in the re rest of that for more complicated locations uh, and also using the AstroPy tools yourself in um, in a Python notebook that you'll be uh, provided, uh, which will be provided to you by the um, uh, by the local staff. OK, thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks for that. Bye.